you, are you ready for the word tonight? Yes. Turn with me in your Bibles. I'm going to find the verse now. Psalm 139. Go with me to Psalms 139. Are you there? I'm trying to get there. All right. And let's go to verse number seven. David writes, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Now, it's amazing how so many people think that you're going to earn your way to heaven, that if you're a good enough person, God will let you in. When God calls David a man after his own heart, he was a murderer, right? An adulterer. And yet, God had mercy on David. And David responds, where am I going to go that your presence isn't there? Where am I going to escape to that your spirit doesn't follow? And we know God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. In fact, I believe that God's power holds together every particle of matter. Every electron, neutron, proton, atom. He holds it all together by his spoken word, by his power. Amen. People would say, I don't need God. You need God to not explode. Yeah. Amen. Or implode or however you want to put it. God's everywhere. And so I've seen people post when you talk about, I just want to, I just want to manifest the presence of God. And they say, well, you know, God's presence is everywhere. What a revelation. I never realized that. We know that, don't we? God's everywhere. But there's a difference between God's omnipresent existence and his manifest presence on our life and in our midst. Amen. God's presence, when it comes on you, shifts everything in your life. Shifts your viewpoints, elevates your faith, uh, increases your love walk. It advances everything. In fact, I believe the presence of God is a portion of the glory of God. And the glory fixes everything. So here a couple months ago, I shared this really at the outset tonight. I was in prayer, and I believe the Lord gave me a download. It wasn't an audible voice. It wasn't, you know, a big visitation. But I had a time that I've had many times with where God just gives me a revelation. And he showed me the advancement of the church through time. How many know God's maturing his church through time? Amen. By bringing them revelation. Every time revelation comes to the church, there's another growth spurt in the spiritual maturity of the corporate body of Christ. See, during the Dark Ages, which really was about 300 A.D. to 1500 A.D., the world had no knowledge of the Word. I mean, just, the, what did I say? The world had no knowledge. Uh, the Word was written in Latin. People weren't allowed to own a Bible. It was, the devil had it all encapsulated in religion. But about 1500, a man came along that got a revelation that just should live by faith. Martin Luther. And God gave Martin Luther's revelation. You're not saved by good, your good works. None can do good enough. But you're saved by faith in the cross. Faith in the sacrifice of Jesus. And you know what? Religion tried to kill him. He lived much of his life with a death row over him. In hiding. The major revival broke out across the world. The Lutheran, uh, what's the word I want? Denomination was birthed. And the revel or revival swept the world that we're saved by faith in Jesus, not by works. It transformed the spiritual maturity of the body of Christ worldwide. But that was just a birthing. Later, other denominations came forth. The Baptists came forth with the revelation of evangelism. I wish the charismatic church could get a hold of evangelism like the Baptists do. I mean, they save a lizard on the street, whatever, you know. 
bleed. And major revival broke forth through the Baptists. Worldwide effect. The Methodists came along with a revelation of sanctification. That it's not enough just to believe in Jesus. You have to change how you live as well. You're not saved by good works. But once you're saved, you should be doing good works. You should let God change your life. I mean, that advanced the church majorly. And then a little over 100 years ago, we had Azusa Street. And God rebirthed. He didn't rebirth. He just poured it out at high levels. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. People have been speaking in tongues for hundreds of years. But it was very select, uh, uh, very, how can I say, limited. But when Azusa Street hit, it swept the world. Amen. I want you to keep in mind what I just said. Remind me to tell you about Azusa Street, the parallel to today. It swept the world. And then we had come along later in the last century, the healing movement. And God had all these men like Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagin and Jack Coe and A.A. Allen setting up tents. And seeing major miracles take place. What was happening, God was reintroducing the power to the church. The miracle power of God. And then later we had men like Kenneth Copeland come along and really Kenneth Hagin would be the forerunner teaching how you can speak the word, believe and speak the word and your circumstances will change. There's power in your words. And we had the word of faith movement. And God's showing me how each one of these advanced the church another level, which we know that. All right. Later we had uh, the heat. So we had the healing, then the word of faith. And then righteousness teaching. Once you're saved, you're no longer a sinner. You're now a saint. Through righteousness, we recognize we're made of the same spiritual DNA as, as God. Amen. Amen. And that, that revelation transformed my life, my walk, my joy of following God. And then we had a prosperity move. Some of it was twisted and misused. But God was really to the church. He wants his, his end time bride wealthy. You follow me? Able to possess versus rent. Able to bankrupt the devil at the appropriate time. God wants his church well off. Amen. 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 I'm just hanging on. And nobody wanted to be like us. But a few months ago, the Lord spoke to me, I should say dropped in me, that he's now bringing forth a move in the church that will usher in the glory of God. And I believe he even dropped in me that it's going to be what we will teach, at least I will teach, uh, uh, consistently until the rapture. I believe I'll see the rapture very soon. Amen. Amen. It will be in our lifetime. And he said, I want you to teach on my manifest presence. The presence of God. Hallelujah. And we started doing that about a month ago. And the first night we taught it, the presence of God just swooped in here. Remember that? Yes. I mean, thick manifest presence. In fact, he's dropping on us right now and feel it. And has been doing it every time we've taught on this topic. His presence has moved in. And I believe it's going to take us to the glory of God. Now I mentioned to you about Azusa Street. Azusa Street was an outpouring of the baptism of the Spirit. But people have been speaking in tongues for, for centuries before that. It just wasn't widespread. It wasn't that easily accessible like it is today, like it was 100 years ago. In the same way, much of the church, all of us, have experienced the presence of God in the past. You follow me? I've experienced the presence of God before I was ever saved. It drew me to God. And after I was saved, we'd come to church and there'd be the presence of God. And people have experienced that presence for hundreds of years. But there's a difference between experiencing 
and living in. And there's levels of the presence. See, I used to drink a lot of alcohol. A lot of alcohol. You'd be amazed at how much alcohol I drank. I'm amazed thinking about it. But three beers, I'd have a buzz. But 12 beers, I couldn't hardly walk. There was a difference in the level of intoxication. Do you follow me? Uh, three beers, that would just be getting started for me, you know. That'd be a non-drinking night for me, just to drink three beers. But if I went out and I was focused on partying, I'm sucking down alcohol all night. And not just beer, probably everything I can get my hands on. I couldn't tell how many tequila worms I've eaten. Yeah. <laughs> and some of them I saw a second time. <laughs> Me hugging the ceramic god Rob was a common occurrence. But I learned in my drinking, I didn't go just part way, I went all in. Once I started, it was done. Thank God, 40 years ago, I asked him to help me. I asked him to deliver me from it, and it was gone. I don't want to drink since. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm not a recovering alcoholic. I'm just not an alcoholic anymore. Amen. I'm, I'm a new person in Christ. Right? Amen. But the point I want to make is, you can do that with the presence of God. Yes. You can go to church and entertain some and experience some, or you can be like the bride's going to be, the glorious bride of Christ, and say, I'm going to get it all. I'm going to do whatever is necessary in my life to obtain and access every bit of the presence of God that I can. But you got to want it. Go with me to Genesis. And I covered some of these voices a couple months ago again. But I want to touch on them again tonight just a bit. Genesis chapter 3. Now Genesis chapter 3, we have the fall of man. You know, they ate the uh, forbidden fruit and they lost their God nature. They received the nature of the devil, fallen nature and nature of sin. The earth was cursed for man's sake. And it says in verse number eight. Well, let's read verse seven. And the eyes of both of them were open. Actually, they were closed to God and open to the world. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed thick leaves together and made themselves aprons. Verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking, the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. One of the first responses we see of man, once he loses his God nature, once he's now made a sinner, is he avoids God's presence. Yes. Right. It's a natural reaction of fallen man not to want to be the illuminating presence of God. Do you follow me? Yes. I mean, when a sinner gets illuminated by the Spirit of God, I mean, when a presence comes on, they have two choices. Get free or flee. Yeah. Right. Did you follow me? Yeah. It's kind of a fight or flight, but it's a get free or flee. Either you stay and say, God, I see you show me truth. I'm going your way. Or you run back to the world and you run from the presence. You run from the callings. You run from anything to do with church because it was too overwhelmingly convicting to show you who you really were. Now, July 1984, my wife and I went to a church service. Both of us were really practiced, well practiced sinners. And the presence of God was there. And the gifts of the Spirit showed up. We both knew that God was speaking to us. And we had to get free or flee decision to make. We both looked at each other and said, I'm getting free. We didn't know we were bound up. We just said, we're going to receive Jesus. And later we found out how bound up we really were. <coughs> Amen, especially her. But, uh, <laughs> not really. Some leftovers for the old man, right? Amen. And so we chose 
to get free. But those that don't know they can get free or choose not to get free will flee from God's presence. Look at Genesis chapter 4. Now we have Cain and Abel. I mean, oh, Cain slew his righteous brother Abel. And it says in verse number 16, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain again goes away, flees from the presence of God. So I believe there's a natural inclination of fallen man to avoid the things of God. You have to have an encounter with God to really want God to change you. To make the change necessary to, to encounter the presence. But it's one thing to enter the presence of God to be somewhere where it's manifested. It's another thing to be a carrier of that presence. So we can go to a hop, hop in church. I mean, you go to a church, they're, you know, praising Jesus. Their doctrine could be bad, but God's still going to have his praises. Do you follow me? And God can be there, and you can enter that presence, but if you get the right doctrine, the right teaching, you can carry that presence. And you become the person convicting people of their need for Jesus. Amen? You don't have to preach to them about how they're a fallen sinner. They get it. They get surrounded by the presence of God and the love of God. They'll know they're a sinner. They'll know there's better. Amen. Amen. I'm trying to decide whether to go to this bunny trailer or not, but I like tools. And I like power tools. And uh, I had one of the first battery drills that came out. Dad got it for me for Christmas one year. I was in love with that battery drill. You could probably use it for five or ten minutes before the battery went dead. <laughs> yeah. But you could drive at least a half a dozen screws if you know. <laughs> like a decker. And uh, I remember the batteries went bad on it. I paid like $80 for putting batteries in it. Yeah. And got home and it still didn't hold a charge. And I got to looking, and there was a nick in my wire on the charger cord. I threw away good batteries, paid 80 bucks for them. Oh, wow. Said I didn't need anyone. Anyway. But later, other battery drills came out. The NICAD batteries, the firestorms, whatever. Man, they would go for a long time without losing, but they weighed 3,000 pounds a piece. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then the lithium batteries came out. My goodness, lithium, glory to God, life last trip. I kept upgrading. And it's been several years back when we were putting letters on the church or other church building, Grace Fellowship letters. And uh, we're trying to drill into this concrete, put screws into it. I drilled a hole, I had a hammer drill, put <clears throat> holes in it. I'm trying to put these concrete screws into the concrete. And my, my good lithium battery drill is not doing it. Aaron dunked him and said, I got something. He goes on his trucks and he brings up an impact driver. And we put it on and he goes, and it went right in. I'm going, thank you, Jesus. Advanced power. I'm always wanting higher levels of tool excellence. I'm always wanting higher levels of the presence of God. I don't know if you can apply this or not. But sometimes you've got to set aside what you've been doing, what you thought you knew, what you thought you had. And make an exchange or a change to go to a higher level of walking with God. And God right now is teaching us the changes we need to make to move to this higher presence. Not just move to it, to carry it. And this is the number one desire of my life is the glory of God. And as I said before, you cannot separate God's presence and God's love from His, from His glory. It's a three-part package. Love, presence, and glory. So, last week, what two weeks, we covered the things you got to do to step into the presence of God. And just to review what they were, one is, you got to determine, I'm going to 
let God clean up my life. And you may say, well, Pastor Jack, I don't have any sin in my life. Well, it's kind of a silly statement, but, you know, I avoid sin. I'm not drinking, smoking, cussing, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm not watching the wrong things, doing the wrong things. I'm avoiding sinful activities. Praise God. That's step one of sanctification. Step two is now got to start changing your motivations. You start dealing with the pride or the unforgiveness, the self-centeredness. He'll start delivering you, and we call it being broken. But he'll start making a change in your life that you're dependent upon him for everything. You follow me? And step three or step two or three may be interchangeable. The third step is... He prioritizes everything you do. Amen. He may tell you you can't watch certain shows anymore. He may tell you you can't watch television anymore. He may tell you, he may tell you to shut off the, 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 the device. I'm not saying he does. But based on your habits, yeah. what draws your time, what pulls you away from God, he may tell you, crucify that. In fact, circumcise it, cut it away. Get it out of your life. Why? Because he's after more time with you. Because without time with God, you won't manifest the presence of God. The second thing we talked about, as far as his presence, is a life of praise. He inhabits our praises. Draw near to him, he draws near to us. As you take effort, you make an effort, you take time to focus on inviting him into your life. In fact, invite him into everything you're doing. Get him involved in whatever project you're on. You know, I played golf last week. Well, I was on the course. And I invited God to help me find my golf balls. Because <laughs> they were scattered everywhere. I don't, I did, I was going to say, I don't think I lost any in the lake, but I did lose two or three in the lake, so never mind that. Invite God in. Let him say, no, don't do that. Don't watch that now. Don't involve yourself in that. Set that up. Go get in my word. We're so used to setting our own priorities in our day that that may not be what God has for us. And God may say, today all I want you to do is sit and read the word. Why don't you just pray in tongues for the next three hours? I can never do that. Well, you can do it. Anybody can do it. You can turn off the television. You can pray for three hours, especially if you pray in tongues. You can be in the Word all day. <coughs> but you got to have the want to. First, you got to want to do whatever God says, and you got to turn your ear to Him to hear what He says to do. Whatever the leading is, to follow it. I'm not trying to make this hard, but you know there's a cost. And stay the course. Don't quit. I'm just telling you, you're going to get what you put into it. So step three is you got to be all in. you got to say, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I'm focused on. I'm not a part-time Christian. I'm a full-time seeker of God. I'm a full-time carrier of the presence of God. I'm a full-time pursuer of the glory. You gotta want it enough that you'll make whatever change in this is necessary. You follow me. And when the presence of God comes on you, everything shifts. Now, I spent some time here a few weeks back talking about uh, the need for a move of God to restore this nation. Remember that? We have a major election coming up. This next election will help determine the future direction of this country. And it's going to be, how can I say, all demonic, hopefully much of God. But one choice is straight from the pit of hell. And God expects us to vote. He expects us to get involved. He expects us to be vocal. You follow me? 
but an election is not going to change this nation as much as it needs to be changed. No. We've got a whole lot of people in the country looking at the election to determine whether God wins or not. Yes. Whether the righteous win or not. Whether the church wins or not. Whether the country survives or not. Right. Yes. It takes more than a move of man to restore what the devil has torn down. And I'm convinced the only thing that can turn this nation around is the glory of God. Amen. Yes. A move of God where the presence of God is poured out on such a level, the populace are transformed. Demonic forces are displaced. And God's glory establishes the right mindsets. Because you, because you cannot defeat demonic activity with man's efforts alone. It requires God to get involved. So I'm going to look at some verses that deal with that. Turn with me to Psalm 9. Are you still with me? And again, the last thing I want to do is make Christianity hard. But the truth is, it's not. What's hard is living without God. Try that again. What's hard is living without God. Yes. I don't believe I would be alive today had I not given my life to God 40 years ago. I definitely wouldn't be married anymore. Do you follow me? I was I never expected to live past, you know, mid-50s. I know I'd drinking myself to death. But thank you, Jesus. You changed the course of my life. Psalm 9, are you there? And let's go to verse number 3. I'm sorry, verse 1. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. There's the all in. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. There's you being vocal about what God's doing in your life. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. There's step 2, praising God. Step 2 to manifest his presence. Praising God. Verse 3. When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. Now first of all, he's talking about the presence of God in verse 3. And it comes out of praising God with your whole heart. Being all in and praising. Steps 1 and 3. In verse 1 and 2. God's presence is coming. His manifest presence is coming on people all in. For people of praise and thankfulness. You thank God in all things. Not for all things, but in all things. Verse 4, Thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou saddest in the throne judging right. Now we see God establishing His rule in the earth. The thing that's needed to bring forth a displacement of darkness is the presence and glory of God. Amen. See, we know Isaiah 60, right? Arise and shine for the light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. He says, for darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. We know, if you have any spiritual sensitivity whatsoever, we are in a season on earth of gross darkness. Yes. France just elected an extreme liberal. As their head. England, same thing. Nations around the world are electing demoniacs to run their country. And we're we're faced right now with the same choice as a nation. Gross darkness is in the world when men don't know if they're they're women or men. When ladies don't know if they're a cat or a person. Do you follow me? When you don't know that you can't open your borders to the entire world and maintain your national integrity. I mean, we could go on and on. Gross darkness is here. And you cannot display gross darkness. Which is more than just a lack of illumination. It's a cloud that people can't see the truth. You cannot displace it by human effort. It takes human effort 
bringing forth a move of God, the presence of God, the glory of God. So it says in Isaiah 60, after you grow dark as the earth, it says, His glory shall arise and be seen upon thee. His glory is coming. It's coming to the earth. I don't know what we'll have to go through before we get there, but the glory is coming. Who's going to carry it? It's not going to be God just waving his hand, okay, here comes the glory. No matter what, here comes it. It's going to be on a people that focus on it, invite it in, and do what's necessary to carry it. It's the glorious bride. It says in Revelation 19, 7, the wife, the bride of the Lamb, has made herself ready. She's made decisions and took steps to position herself for the glory to come on her. Anybody want to take those steps? I try to do it as if I was a screaming preacher. Anybody want to take those steps? Yeah. 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 Well, I get a reaction somehow, praise God. <laughs> you got to want it to be willing to pursue it. It's free, but it'll cost you everything. Amen. Psalm 68. I saw this today. And again, this is a verse I've already taught in here, but I saw it differently. Psalm 68, are you there? Verse 1, let God arise. That his enemies to be scattered. How many want God's enemies to be scattered right now? Yes. Some people need to scatter them out of their own life before you scatter them around them. Let them also that hate him flee before him. They would have to experience the presence of God to know what to flee from. As smoke is driven away, verse 2, as smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Here's something I've not seen before. Let's, just, let's say you're in a big smoke-filled warehouse. Black smoke everywhere. Is there anything you can do of your own ability to dispel that smoke? You can wave your arms all you want. It's just smoke. It's just moving it. You're still surrounded by smoke. Anything you can do with wax by human power to cause it to melt. Well, I can rub it real fast. Right. Well, it's going to maybe drip and solidify right away again. Right. What I believe this verse is telling us is the enemies that we're facing cannot be dispelled by human effort alone. You have no ability to chase out the smoke. You have no ability to cause the wax to melt. But the presence of God will deal with both of them. God's presence does what we can't do of our own ability. Yes, amen. I'm believing for right results in this next election. Yes. But I'm believing for a move of God to be combined with it. Yes. And we're seeing it right now. God's visiting college campuses. Yeah. Major baptism service. They yeah. named Tennessee last, or night before last night, I'm talking about Tennessee having a major move of God. Yeah. Texas A&M. Texas colleges all around, major moves of God. I'm ready for it to hit our schools. Yes. Yes. The you know, the, there was a possible two about 78. Yeah. The 78 people. Yes. I'm ready for it to hit our churches. I want to take it to the supermarket. Yes. We need a major move of God. Amen. I had this confirmed to me last week in Virginia. I went to a church, uh, visited, talked with some of the leaders of it, talked with the apostle of the church. And they were talking about, I'm trying to think how to word this, Moves of God. And a year ago, a little over a year ago, we had the Asbury visitation, right? Right. That man shut down. 
because it interfered with man's plans and man's schemes, so they shut it down. So when it happened, I decided I want to do everything I can to allow it to be continued to some level. So we started free concerts in our other church. We had, I, I got online to a, it was a Facebook site called Facebook site called Christian Musicians Wanted. And I put I'm looking for people to come to Georgetown to play for free, just for offerings. I got swamped with people wanting to come. We had bands last year backed up wanting to come and play at our venue. We had everything from Southern Gospel to uh, uh, rap to uh, grunge, grunge rock. Yeah. And God was showing up almost every time. And we put speakers outside to, to play the music to them all. And in the midst of it, New owners got together and decided we need to buy that mall. In fact, we're going to buy the mall. We're going to kick the church out. I don't think that was accidental. I think the devil saw a threat and moved through people with money to shut down what God wanted to do. Thank you, Jesus. I know we didn't catch fire, but I believe we would have. I believe we would have caught on. It's just an adaptation and an adjustment, right? The enemy is afraid of the presence of God. Because it's the only thing that threatens his operations. And so what did he have to do? He had to shut us down. At least he thought he did. But God is an expert at putting people in hiding for the right exposure time. Right. And mark my words, we're in hiding right now. We're in a personal development time. See, we'll stay with it, hang with it, and go into the glory. If you remember David, just to kind of take another sidetrack, remember David, King David? He slew Goliath. And all the people are singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. Right. And he's celebrated as the hero of the country. He's supposed to marry, well, he does marry the king's daughter. You know, gets tax free for his family, all these blessings. And the king is threatened by David's positioning. And Saul tries everything he has to kill David. All they could do was shoot him in the ear. I mean, all they could do was throw a lance at him. <laughs> Took y'all a minute on that. Amen. It did take a minute. <laughs> Couldn't kill him. But you find David who's already demonstrated faith in God. Already demonstrated he will he will refuse the armor of the natural system and choose to trust in God for his victory. Is celebrated as a conqueror. And the next thing you know, in 2 Samuel, no, 1 Samuel 22, he's in the cave of Adullam with everybody that's in distress, discontented, and in despair, it says. A cave full of people that aren't happy with their situation, in hiding, teaming with a person who is in hiding. Trusting God. And God later turned that group into David's mighty men. Those who stayed with it, later he came out of the king, out of the cave. He's made king. And those that hid with him are promoted. And God mentions many of them by name when he's given, when he's given the uh, testimony about David. And I believe right now we're in our own cave of the doom. I'd hoped after, after 30, 31 years of full-time ministry, I'd be out of the cave by now. <laughs> but we just got put back in it. Yeah. But you know what it is? It's a time of those that are discontented. It's what it says. Discontented, in distress, and uh, dead. Dead. Or discouraged, yeah. Have come in, 
And they learn unity. They learn trusting in God for the protection. Or the resources. And God kept bringing them everything they needed. Even brought Saul in at one time. And David could have killed him on the yeah. spot. And David lets him go. They're learning total trust in God to live by faith. And when it was time. See they weren't ready before. But when it was time they're released. To run the kingdom. I believe God has plans for us. We just got to make sure we maintain our expectation and our hope. Are you still with me? So nothing we can do to drive off smoke and melt wax on our own. But God can do it. Uh, Psalm 68. That's where I want to go. Psalm 68. We're right there, are we? Go to verse number 8. You're shook. The heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Now here it says, by the presence of God, you're shook. I can just see God holding on the earth on both sides. Not that this is a real thing that's going to happen. But just, shh. <laughs> <laughs> Have anybody seen the, the young boy with the dice and the clear tube? And he shakes it. Yeah. There's this young boy. He's got about a dozen dice. And he scrapes them off the counter. He puts them in this clear tube about that big around, about this long. And he starts doing this with it. And when he stops, all the dice are stacked on each other. He had learned how to get them to line up and go into the right place and stack up. And he stops them all together. I can see God doing that. I'm going to shake things up. But when I stop, things will be in the right position. Part of it will be we will have our own facility. We'll have a worship team. You follow me? Plenty of parking, classrooms, teachers, the whole works. That's which right. is great, but you know what we'll have? We'll have the glory of God. Hallelujah. Which provides everything else. So God says he shakes things up with his presence. Yes. Think about the day of Pentecost. 120 people just gathered together. And the Spirit of God blows in like a rushing mighty wind. They're all filled with the Holy Ghost. Start speaking with tongues so the Spirit gives them utterance. And all these people come to get saved. I want you to hear me about this. If it wasn't for the spoken tongues that brought everybody to become saved, 8,000 people in a week, it wasn't, it wasn't they spoke in tongues. Even though they heard us speak in their own language, oh, that's a wonderful sign. Well, praise <coughs> God. That might get a few to turn. What allowed that harvest to come in is the extreme release of the presence of God in that scene, in that location. The glory of God coming in, into manifestation and all these new believers come in. Because Isaiah 60 again says, after the glory rises upon thee, he says, your sons and daughters shall come from far. to be nursed at your side. The glory brings in the harvest. But our enemies are scattered at it. The devil right now has a firm grasp on most of the world. Even nations that call themselves Christian are run by demonic people for the most part. There's exceptions now and then. But God's got a plan to manifest himself in the midst of the people. Just set things right. Now he says here, the heavens dropped at the presence of God. And I started thinking about that. Well, I know when the presence of God comes in, it's going to be like the third heaven dropping down to the first. The third heaven is where God dwells. So we, we experience the presence of God. It's going to be like heaven on earth. Heaven on our midst. But also what I believe it references, because it's talking about God's enemies, the second heaven is where the devil 
functions out of. He operates out of the second heaven, the realm of the soul. And this is going to be brought down to the first. It's going to be collapsed. His operations to control men's mind and dominate feelings and emotions and thought is going to be neutralized. Why? Because the presence of God displaces demonic activity. Are you getting anything out of this? Yes. I'm preaching myself and nothing else. I'm enjoying it. But he says, even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Sinai moved at the presence of God. Sinai is where Moses received the Ten Commandments and all the law. It's representation of the Old Testament, the old law, the commandments. And God said, even the commandments bow because they were, they were created for the presence of God. You follow me? Not to limit it. He says, the law will bow to my presence. It fulfills it. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. He was the manifest presence of God on earth. Because he was God on earth, right? right. Carrying the presence wherever he went. And he fulfilled the law on our behalf. But he fulfilled the law so we could carry the presence. And you get coded in the presence of God. The law will become a non-factor in your life because you will automatically follow what God says. Psalm 97. Psalm 97. Oh, we just read this in the form. Verse number five. The hills melted like wax. There's our wax melting again. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. Lord of the earth. And the hills melt like wax. Now hills, mountains, they represent obstacles in our path. That for us are, un, un, how can I say, we can't overcome them of our own ability. A mountain is anything in front of you, between you and your goal, that you're going to need God to remove. So you speak the word in faith, and the mountain must be uprooted and thrown in the sea, right? That's right. Mark 11. So. All the obstacles we face that seem impenetrable are overcome by manifesting God's presence. And this is what came to me out of this. New church facilities, debt free, properly located, exactly what we need, are coming to our hands. Amen. Even though it seems impossible. I was speaking to Pastor David a while ago, who is the assistant pastor here, about maintaining our operations here through October. And he was fine with that we're staying through October. But he said, you know, he just spoke to me, you know, the Georgetown market is so crazy. It seems impossible for you to find a church here. Yes. But the hills melt like wax before the presence of God. Amen. We want our church facility. Let's manifest His presence. Let's press in. What we can't afford to do is get discouraged. Well, I thought we were on. I love that other church. We were on the way. And it's not the building; it's the heart. That's right. And I can manifest just as much of God's presence here as I could there, and more. Right. The path isn't always what we thought we wanted. Sometimes there's a humbling involved even. You follow me? I went from a nice building to now I'm borrowing a building. But you know what? 
I'm not left off pursuing God. I'm not left off speaking the word. I'm not left off praying. I'm still after everything he has. This is just a stopping point on the way to our next position of glory. Wherever it may be. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. But have you got anything out of this tonight? Yes. Father, we thank you, Lord God. What you've taken us through. We praise you for what you're taking us into. And we choose to cooperate with you in anything you want us to do. Anything you want us to give, speak. Uh, transform in our lives. We just want your presence. We want your glory. Make this real to us. And I decree right now, as everyone here, as they set forth, just to put forth some effort. To pursue God's presence, you show up, Lord God. In a fashion way above what they thought they could experience. Addict, addict each of us to this assignment that is more important than anything else in the world. We thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I decree in here there are none sick, none in lack, none oppressed, none in fear, none in strife. In Jesus' name.